criticism for the New Yorker, the London Review of Books, Granta, and other places. Her books have been translated into 20 languages and she lives in Toronto. Um, and I forgot, so before I do the next introduction, I wanted to say um, thank you to our supporters and funders, the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, otherwise known as the SCFD, the Bonfi Stanton Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, next up is Ariana Raines. She's a poet, an Obie-winning playwright, and performing artist. Her books include A Sand Book, The Play Telephone, The Origin of the World for the Whitney Biennial, Mercury, Cor de Lion, and The Cow. She has created performances for the Guggenheim and Whitney Museums and many galleries and venues around the world. She was honored this year with the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Prize for A Sand Book, which was also a finalist, finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, and it was also long listed for the National Book Award. Claudia Moran was born and raised in Guadalajara, Mexico and moved to Denver in 2002. She participated in various archeological projects in Northeastern Mexico sponsored by, the Mexican, by Mexican and American universities. Claudia holds a master's degree in museum administration from the University of Colorado Boulder, as well as a bachelor's in archeology span from the National School of Anthropology and History in Mexico City. She has been at Museo de las Americas since 2006 and has served in many capacities there, including Director of Education, Director of Operations, and most re recently as the organization's Executive Director. Welcome, Claudia. Derek Velasquez is an artist and exhibition organizer who lives and works in Denver, Colorado. He holds a BA in Art Studio and in Art History from the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, and an MFA from The Ohio State University. Santa Barbara, are they the banana slugs? Is that really what they are? No, that's Santa Cruz. That's Santa Cruz, sorry. Santa Barbara we're, is the, we're the, the gauchos. 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 Right. gauchos. Go gauchos. Sorry, I digress. Um, recent exhibitions include solo shows at the Heron School of Art and Design in Indianapolis, the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver, Robuchon Gallery, um, Pentimenti Gallery, the Black Cube Nomadic Museum, also in Denver. He has had recent group expositions, exhibitions, I'm sorry, at the Flowers Gallery and Transmitter, both in New York, and the Frame Gallery at Carnegie Mellon University of Pittsburgh. He's a 2017 recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation grant for painters and sculptors. Thank you all for being here. It's great to see you all. Um, I hope you're doing well. Everybody doing okay? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, the, the way that the salons are working virtually is that um, I'm going to throw out a question. Uh, first question to get the conversation started, and then uh, the panelists will chat for a while. Um, and then when it feels pertinent, we'll um, move to audience questions, which you should just pose in the Q&A um, section of your Zoom browser. So um, the description for this uh, salon is um, pretty... Uh, this feels like a very serious salon. Uh, it, it starts out with, we're living through dark times that require the village vigilance in the face of systemic biologic, cultural, political, and intellectual upheaval. How do we justify spending time making and consuming art when we should be at a protest or making money? And then there's a sort of an existential question. What does art even do? Um, and uh, thinking about this, this, uh, this salon, I remember at one point in a, in a previous, probably a previous Lit Fest, um, I said something that um, has sort of stuck with me. Not that I'm very impressed about things that I say, usually I'm horrified, but I was sort of half joking. I said, um, art is the ambulance for the injured soul and all souls are injured in some way. Um, and I'm not sure if that really helps frame the question uh, or the conversation, but I wanted to start with just a couple of thoughts. So um, I don't know about you, but 2020, a year of perspective has been, um, it's been quite, quite, an, quite a thing. Um, and I just wanna run a quick summary of some of the major events that, that I've seen, that, that I see it and that have happened. So obviously 2020, January, uh, pand worldwide pandemic begins. January 21, American Dirt is released. February 5th, Donald Trump is acquitted of impeachment charges by the US Senate. February 9th, the Academy Awards happen. Parasite takes best Oscar for screenplay, best international film, best film and best director. February 23rd, Armand Arbery is murdered outside of Atlanta. In mid-March, uh, for us, it was March 13th, basically, which is Friday, of, what was a Friday the 13th, 
the whole country goes on lockdown, or at least it felt like it. Also on March 13th, Breonna Taylor is murdered during a no-knock raid in Louisville. March 15th, uh, the last Democratic debate happens um, where Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders are socially distant. Uh, May 25th, George Floyd, uh, Floyd is murdered in Minneapolis. Protests begin everywhere. The end of May um, 2020 um, is recorded as the hottest May ever on record. June 1, the President of the United States has National Guard clear peaceful protesters from Lafayette Square for a photo op in front of St. John's Church with a Bible in his hand. So, and that's just a, a small summary of what's happened this year. And so I guess the, uh, the question I want to pose to you all, in light of all of that, where and how do you see art urgently speaking to or not speaking to these current times that we're in? Who's excited to jump into that one? Should I call on somebody? <laughs> um, well, I'll say, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, uh, the fortunate thing when you first say about like, maybe we should be protesting and making money, we can hopefully do all these things at the same time. Um, it is something that you have to kind of cycle through in order to, <clears throat> in all these times, keep yourself as um, stable as possible because there's a lot of uh, instability in both the personal and kind of the world. But artists are, writers, creatives are all very flexible and adaptable. And I think that that is um, something that will hopefully allow us to speak towards some of these times. Um, you know, I question what my own subjectivity is in this world, which is um, how can that be a small tool for others to see a lens um, through something that they may not have the experience through. And um, I find myself sharing artists and writers that I, um, that I respect with a lot of people. And I think that that is one thing that um, we can do as artists and the way that art might function in the world right now is to like, is to share what we know um, with other people who might not quite have the language for um, what they're feeling right now. And that's really important to me, um, even though I've been like very, very isolated for the last three months but sharing is something that for me has kind of like helped me, um, I don't know, push myself and feel it's not just like talking to somebody, but it's like giving and receiving uh, through sharing is something that I think can really happen from, from artists and writers. I will go next. Um, I will say that um, probably historically speaking, you know, art has been like a way to to speak out, to represent a group that needs to say something that hasn't had opportunity to say it. But also, I'm not an artist, although I will say that um, from what I have seen lately in the different movements, it is a natural and organic, like Derek said. You know, artists will come and express this in the most um, clear way that I have seen. So they can definitely, you know, kind of synthesize or kind of put together a great bunch of ideas coming for a strong group. So I think that through the art right now is, is just one more time is speaking about like a group of people that wants to say something. And I think it's in different ways, but in any of those different ways, people will, will feel that they have been represented somehow. So I don't know, I will say like for an exhibition, I can say like right now we can receive three or four different proposals for different groups and along the lines we are speaking, all of them are speaking about the same, different ways.
but uh, but I think it's that like you know like energy and like synergy to really like sort of like bend what's happening but it's also how they bring this cumul cumulative um, set of ideas and that are just like kind of canalizing like driving taking them in different ways so to speak I don't know if I was clear but that's how I see it right now. Thank you. Yeah. Ariana, did you want to? I think you might be muted. <laughs> I have to get to work on that. Um, yeah, somehow your microphone's not working. We have, we have, we have, do have a tech support department, so they'll, um, <laughs> sit tight. Hopefully we can figure that out. Um, yeah, so, can you give us that? We'll get this worked out. Okay. That's our tech person. That's Jenna. Thank you, Jenna. <laughs> Sheila, did you want to respond? Um, yeah, I, uh, I think I also, I agree with, um, Derek and Claudia, and I also want to put in something for art being absurd and coming from often a place that we don't even understand and that there's something about art that's not rational and to live through these tumultuous moments, what the artist might create might not be something that seems clearly helpful or even clearly in relation to what's happening. But I think that the task of the artist is to sort of trust whatever needs to be done with their work that day. I mean, I, you know, when the lockdown started, I found an immense amount of uh, life affirming energy reading Gertrude Stein, um, the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. And she talks in that book about going and becoming an ambulance worker and being politically active and helping, but she also wrote this book. And I can't even say why it gave me so much of a sense of place. I don't, I, you know, it had nothing to do with where I was, but it still made me feel more rooted in this particular moment in history. And I don't think that that was anything that she was actively trying to do by writing that book was making somebody who lives a hundred years from now, from when she was in, you know, World War II in this tumultuous time to make that person feel rooted in a kind of humanity. But um, I'm great. I'm glad that she sort of trusted whatever she needed to do each day with her art. So I feel there's there's art that can really importantly respond to the moment. The day that you make it is the day that it's received. But there's also something about art where you're making it for all of history. You're making it for this moment, but you're making it for moments that haven't come yet. And um, I think that we can't really even know how we're doing that except to have faith that some some things sometimes you have to live th through things and 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 the germination is slow and the product you know is for future people but i admire um i admire like the art impulse that that is for the moment but i don't think that every artist can do that you know i think some people are just uh they're meta they metabolize things slower mm -hmm. yeah yeah it reminds me, I think it was Dennis Smith in a recent um, salon, he said, um, you know, activist poems, we, we need those, but we also need poems about grandma and the moon as well. We, so keep writing those. And I thought that was really kind of an interesting sentiment. Um, Ariana, are you, um, are you on? No, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> okay, we'll keep working on the issue with you, Ariana. I'm so sorry, that's not, usually something that happens, but we'll figure it out. Um, and thanks for your patience, everybody. Right. Jenna said there was something every time. So this is the <laughs> something you are okay. I thought we were doing like so good with like not single like weird tech ghost in the system, but there's a tech <laughs> ghost in the system. Um, Ariana, I'm going to send you a text. Um, so you can hear from me in just a minute. Well, one thing, so at least her, her mute, um, her little mute icon is showing. I wonder if, if we could try to turn it off. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Uh, hear you now. <laughs> Got it. So sorry. <laughs> I had to bring the mer the retrograde Mercury to the. <laughs> now I know what you're gonna what you're gonna say is gonna be so amazing. <laughs> I know. Um, you know, 
I so I, I I do agree with everything that's been said, and of course there's been more isolation. But artists are kind of good at isolation already because we we have this. Um, it's part of the training of, of the endurance of learning how to make artworks is that we have this practice dealing with ourselves. So there's certain like basic psychological skills that um, that artists can sh can share um, both in in mass uprising and in um, and in social distancing. But I, I guess I wanted to speak to something about the idea that these are dark times. Um, I find these times to be exhilarating and truthful, and I find them quite, it, it's, um, it's certainly horrifying, gut-wrenching, and it's a, an experience of death um, like never before. And yet, I also feel that my entire adult life has been, <laughs> it's been a preparation for this time. It's not like any of this comes out of nowhere. None of it comes out of nowhere. None of it is a surprise. It's, and, and a lot of the social distancing that the pandemic instilled had already been setting in, in all kinds of ways um, as, as, as sort of various kinds of media have interposed themselves in between one person and another, in between, um, you know, movements and collectivities and the sort of wider world. And I, I just kind of feel like one of the things that art does is give testimony to whole worlds of experience that don't have monuments to bear witness to them, you know, there aren't men on horseback in bronze uh, testifying to the human experience of love. Um, we don't have that kind of real estate um, for the most important experiences of being human. You know, they they're they're genuine, generally not monumentalized. They're and and in in the United States, um, we don't deal with death. We deal, we deal death, but we don't deal with it. We don't like to face it. We don't like to think about it. We don't like to look at it. And um, so for me, there's, there's a side of all of this that, that feels like, yeah, right. This is the world. This is part of the world that I've been trying to bear witness to as long as I've been writing. And that doesn't mean I'm happy you know, but fuck happiness. That's not what I deal in either. Like it, there, but there's an exhilaration to the truth. And like the truth is what I want to marry. And I feel like, you know, it's not a matter of like, oh, I have some fun. I have this finite amount of time and I should be protesting instead of writing poems or I should be writing poems instead of protesting or, you know, everybody's economics have been kind of fucked, you know, and we all have to do uh, to do things. And it's true that artists are we are luck lucky to, to have more flexibility, more adaptability and relatively speaking, more fluidity and freedom than other so called industries. Um, I practice an art that nobody knows what the hell it is which is great because you can get away with a lot since nobody knows what it is. Um, and, you know, so in, in many ways as artists in this time, we're very privileged um, because we've had a chance to learn how to deal with ourselves already. And, and because a lot of the things that are being made manifest are, are things that have obsessed and nodded us um, all our lives, and and now it's a chance to actually meet reality with more more of the collective um, tuned in, I guess. Yeah, hell yeah, that's great. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody. I think um, there's so many thoughts. I, I I I'm I'm really intrigued by what you what you said about um, death, Ariana, and. Um, 
you know, death is, is the ultimate truth, I guess, in some ways, right? It's also the, uh, the thing that connects us, you know, to kind of go back to a little bit to what, what, what Derek was talking about. I think, you know, there's that old idea that all art is really an attempt to, um, to try to figure out mortality. Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but I think it's an interesting concept. Um, but I'm also intrigued by that idea of change doesn't happen in, as an art form um, uh, in, in the art world or um, the way art works, or even I think in social or political change, doesn't ha you can't have change without the death of that which already exists. I mean, modernity is that, you know, I think um, Alice B. Toklas is an, is, an ex is an example of that. It's to try to do something, try to make it new, right? To try to do something that has never been done before and to actually um, plow right over that which is, um, has stood in terms of an art form. Um, and obviously, you know, we're in a postmodern world, but I think in many ways um, that is still happening. And I, I'm also intrigued by the idea that it's also definitely happening in our culture. What do you think of that? <laughs> yeah, I think that, that uh, kind of going to uh, what Ariana said about, you know, scu uh, sculptures or monuments are being torn down. This is like a great example of, of maybe not just the individual mortality, but even the mortality of art artworks themselves. I mean, some of those monuments aren't, they are portraits and maybe not necessarily pictures. Um, and some of those portraits need to come down, but somebody made that thing. And the way that some of those made were nefarious and um, especially like a lot of the Confederate monuments being torn down were, you know, made not after the Civil War, but, you know, kind of more during the Civil Rights Movement and those are being torn down now. Um, so, I mean, there's even a finiteness to potentially what your art could do and how long it could last, even the abstract expressionists who were making both in America and in Japan and all over the world, we're trying to come to terms with World War II. And, um, you know, now it's become a little more of like uh, an aestheticized type of artwork that we understand as abstract expressionism. But at the time they were trying to deal with a lack of language and, um, and now we maybe even like see it differently. So even the work that you make can have maybe different meanings as it goes through time and being able to release that, I think um, is very freeing. Like I think art um, and probably writing is like an act of liberation, both for the individual and potentially even um, for larger groups of people as well. Um, and liberating yourself from the finality of it, I think is something that I am finding during these specific times in relation to the pandemic and to the protests. Um, like I said, like abstract expressionism, they were like, it, it lacked words or in some ways narrative um, because of World War II. And now in America, we have Black Lives Matter. Their language is very like crystallized. Like we understand like what they're trying to say and they have words. It's like, say the, uh, victims of police brutality say their names um and as artists as an artist like i can feel myself like receding when i need to recede and coming to the front when i need to um so kind of as sheila said you know you're making art for the time that you have right now but you might be able to think about the future or not think about the future and i think that flexibility is is uh, again as ariana kind of said like we can flex in and out of those things quite maybe we're hopefully prepared for it, you know? I mean, I think what's kind of interesting about this time is like, it's not the first shitty time on planet earth. It's like not the first time that there's been terrible injustice um, and or that ter terrible injustice has been met with, um, with a strong opposition, you know? And sometimes what, sometimes we don't have a long enough view but what what is happening i think like in a, in a new way is we have because we have um be, because we're, we, we're digitized there's there's things happening to consciousness and to the heart 
on a mass scale. And that's kind of freaky. That's unusual. So it's it's not like it's not like this kind of murder and extraction culture and and totalitarianism is a new thing, but what's new is 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 us all having to pass that horror through our individual eyeballs and brains and hearts and bodies and nervous systems. And so and so it does kind of like shift and it, it shifts some aspects of the art of, of an artist's practice and like obviously there's so many different ways of doing art and as Sheila said there's different velocities of responding and sometimes a really eloquent testimony to a period of time isn't necessarily the protest poem it is the grandma poem or the flower painting or whatever but like I guess like you know, it's also just on a very basic level, um, there's aspects of, of art practice that are available to all people that can make a person more resilient um, and healthy. Um, and maybe this is some of the li liberty that you were talking about, Derek. Like, it's like not everyone has to be like a monk or a nun to their like weird, practice like i wouldn't necessarily recommend it to everybody but 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 having but but being able to have an experience um of a practice um it it, it also helps to sustain the heart and the soul um through time and space um and through tribulation and i think i think that's why we still have it that's why we still have art because it's it it helps people get through all kinds of weird shit with mastodons and warlords and whatever. I would say that it's also like a healing process too, just because we uh, I mean, if these conversations or these issues happen in a way that you can definitely not share or have an opinion because you may be criticized or just because you don't have the opportunity to speak out. I think through, through different art forms, people can really relate and have that opportunity like, an op like a window, you know, like to express something that someone else is having or sharing and then we can talk about it. So I see it also like a healing process because I mean, even just speaking in terms of like, any community even no, but in specific like we can focus on something like immigrant community and then they want to say something about it and once they can relate to a group of people that are saying they will feel that confidence and to basically go through the process and open up and 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 like we we can say and create a movement create a march create a so many different opportunities to really go through the whole piece and heal because there is no other way to overcome these issues if it's not through a painful process of you know like speaking and debating and 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 feeling it and and also coming back to things that many people may say I don't want to talk about it because it's, I've been dealing with this my whole life so I don't even want to say because you, there is a process for you to protect yourself. So if you want to definitely reopen or take that opportunity, you have to uh, feel that support from another group from, uh, you know, and I think art plays a big role in this, in this game. Mm -hmm. I keep thinking about the question of the panel, what is art for? And it seems to me like it's sort of an unanswerable question because everyone has their own answer to that. There's no universal answer to that. But on the, I think like Claudia is saying, like on a very, very basic level, art is for the person that's making it and the people that are making it. There's a need and it's, um, it's, I think healing is one way of thinking about it. And to me also, it's just like um, transforming uh, 
there's just um, an alchemy. And I kind of feel like what art is for is like taking the world, which comes without value, uh, comes without judgment. It just comes as a series of realities and facts that we have to make sense of. Every individual has to make sense of it. And art is a way of making sense of the environment that we find ourselves in mysteriously. We didn't ask to be here and here we are. And there's all this stuff happening all the time. And art is a way of giving meaning to all these things that don't inherently necessarily have meaning. And in a, in a very intense political moment, you know, I would say I would be surprised if that impulse to make art wasn't more activated in more people because art is a way of metabolizing the world and turning it into something else, something that you can hold and see and make sense of and have some kind of power over and have some kind of, it's a response. And, you know, it's so, I, I, I have various friends that aren't artists and they seem to be drawing, they seem to be just making these artistic um, uh, gestures, um, not for anything, but it's like a deep human need, like eating, you know, <laughs> or have, there's just some human need. And I think that's what art is for. And um, if anything, you know, but yeah. I, I think that's so exact, that's exact, so, so, so wise. I mean, the, the, the impulse to create something as an attempt to um, just understand, um, you know, the world, just to process experience. Um, I think also it's an attempt to um, tap into that, you know, uh, kind of like what you were talking earlier uh, about earlier, Sheila, that sort of non-rational part of your brain. Uh, I think there's something um, very pleasurable and comforting about that. Um, I think also the experience of seeing and viewing art um, is, is that as well. Um, I think it's also obviously a, a form of connection, um, which sort of leads me to another question. And then I think we'll go to the, the Q and A. Um, obviously, you know, a place like Lighthouse wouldn't exist if it, if we didn't have a lot of citizen artists, you know, or <laughs> the population, uh, a lot of them didn't feel like they had the, they, they had the impulse to, to write, to, to be creative using language. Um, and I always wonder, like, is, is this something that's always been inherent? And if so, was it suppressed for a while? And now is it coming out? Um, and certainly I do feel like it addresses, it addresses a, um, a way of trying to deal with the, the current world. Um, but it's also just a very natural thing. And, and it, are we in some ways in, in a lucky time because um, individuals, individuals can do that without thinking about market or audience or any of those things? I would love it if we had, if, if we could build a future where um, people felt more at home in their natural creativity and didn't um, have this um, terrible pressure that the economics of our, of our time and of our world put on everyone. Um, there's brilliantly gifted and amazing people who don't practice art professionally. And, um, and I think there's also weird shame that people have if they can't make it their um, profession or something. And it just, it feels like such a warping of the human majesty and um i i personally love environments where you can do art with with a really big range of ages and professions and lifestyles at least for the art of poetry like i don't know what it's like to do ceramics or <laughs> something else um but poetry is something that um, it's so enriched by, by being shared and practiced in a space full of people who are really in different places and in different stages of life and styles of life. And um, it's, it's so close to nothing and yet so very strange and difficult that 
it's a nice secret portable art that can fit into almost any lifestyle. And there's something very democratic about that. And I would love, I would love a world where um, this, this sort of terrible professionalization wasn't walling people off from whole parts of who they are. Anyone else want to respond to that? Who wants to go next? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, I can go to the questions. Thank you for that, Arjun. Um, um, yes, go ahead, Claudia. Yeah, um, I will say that uh, for me, I would really like, I mean, like to explore like the possibility in this specific case and uh, like how can I write more and better just to be able to speak because sometimes I feel that if it's like a physically hand or your mouth where you can say or sometimes see something I will say through an art expression you can definitely open those doors like open yourself to so many opportunities but like in a way that whether you are exploring but also changing like the way to say things in 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 and be heard so for example like uh, to me like if we were all able to write something and be and express and put it all together i mean that would be a fantastic way to be listened and be heard and be and be and be um, you know consider somehow for 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 a change or for something that we all need to do. So going back, yeah, it's like definitely if we can have an opportunity to express ourselves, and this is a great opportunity, definitely for me. I think so too. It's like uh, sort of like let ourselves explore more to to be able to to say something a different way and probably will create some sort of magic, possibly. I love that, yeah. Sheila, did you want to say something? No, I was just enjoying Claudia's answer. <laughs> <laughs> Your microphone is off, so I figured maybe. Oh. <laughs> um, so um, the first question is, um, is art, small a, art, capital A, question mark, or must it be in service of something bigger? Should it have another goal other than being? I think that's an interesting question. And I think that's the question for even, I, I, I understand that question. And I think, well, just to move the conversation to the technical aspect of making art, I think that's the struggle is you make something that is for its own sake and for itself and that is an impulse and a need. And then you think, what do I do with this? And do I, what else is it for? But I, for me, I feel like that question comes after the first making, after the thing is first comes onto your page, then you think, well, what should this be transformed again and you know, and you ask yourselves those intellectual questions: What's it for? What am I trying to evoke? Da 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 da. But I, for me, I think the real art, the art that I love, I often love like when I go to a museum and they show all the artists' finished paintings. I can't remember. I was like at a Monet exhibit or something, and then they had one painting that was half done that he'd never finished. And that was my favorite one. Like, I was just like, oh, there's so much life and energy in this. And I always want to like make an anthology of fragments of just like, give me, send me your fragments that you have been carrying from computer to computer that you've never been able to like put into a bigger artwork that you've never been able to ask, answer that question for, like, what is this for? So it remains in its purest nugget, mm -hmm. untransformed, you know, Ar Ariana's talking about the, like the, 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 uh, professionalization of art that walls off people but there's also like a professionalization of the art form that walls off the things that the artists create that can't be 
a novel or can't be a poem or can't be a painting that are something less than that. Like Derek and I were at an artist colony together and he gave us the experiments that he was making. And to me, this was like so much better, this sort of like detritus experiment than a finished artwork. And so I think there's like a real vitality in that. And I think it there it's just capitalism that lets us not find a place for those things that we have to sort of just keep them in our house with us. Um, but to me, that's where the real life is in, in, in art. I oh man, I love that. So um, I was a biology major in college and then I went to go see a Picasso documentary and it was, it was a video of him actually painting. And it, they somehow did it so that you, the camera's on the other side of the, of the canvas. Right, so you yeah. wouldn't see his, his brush strokes or anything. I just love it. And that made me change my, 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 my major to English and, and now I'm here. <laughs> but I think there's something about that. Um, the energy uh, and the rawness of that unfinished work. And what is it that's so captivating about that? Um, Do you think anyone can answer? Are you asking me? <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I, I, anybody, but I think, I guess first you, yes. I don't know. It's like, it's like having sex. I mean, it's just like the body doing its thing. It's like the human doing its thing. There's no what for, like when you're, when you're, I, I, it's an, it, what's so captivating about that is that it's not, those questions can't even be answered. Like it's actually just such an expression of a deep impulse that our reason can't really completely take apart. There's something beyond what reason can take apart that's just real. Like what's a tree for? Like the, that, that pure art that I'm talking about that's before the novel is like the tree, like it just grows, it grows out of us. And, and that's beautiful, you know, and vital. So maybe we're getting out, maybe I'm gonna get too theoretical here, but in some ways is art an attempt to undercut um, or to push against reason? I think it's just instinct. Like, I think there's just an instinct to make art. Like there's an instinct to fall in love and to have sex and to eat and to have de shelter. Like there's an art instinct in humans and and that artwork to me is like, I've, I've been writing a novel through this COVID time with a 10 year old, my friend's 10 year old. And like, it's just to do, it's just this need to like, we're locked, we're away from people. Like we just need to make art. We need to connect with each other and express what we're going through. Um, I don't know, to me, it's just a natural thing rather than something transformed by industry. And to me, I don't know what, about you guys, but like when I'm editing, I'm always trying to keep it as close as possible to that original form. And so there's always this battle of wanting to sort of finish and wanting to be it to be for something and then wanting to keep that first impulse. Interesting. Yeah, do others feel that way? Yeah, like the alive, the like alive, the aliveness of it needs to be not killed. It's like, if it's too much, if it's too much art, capital A, I mean, I, I love that you, Sheila, that you understood that question. Cause I was like, I think I don't understand this question <laughs> because I don't know the difference between the small A and the big A, like. I didn't either. <laughs> but, like, but like, but I love the question, like but it's kind of that thing of like, but I, what I'm like vibing on or resonating with, um, is like the the sense of and I I too share that like love and passion for the unfinished um, especially in visual art like maybe it's a writer thing like I just I love those unfinished pieces um, and that and they, they're the ones that stay with me like this unfinished Cezanne that I've never forgotten and like a couple of unfinished Michelangelo's that I once saw they they like stay with me for some reason. Um, because you can feel him and you know that feeling and and instead of it being the museum piece that you've seen 10,000 times reproduced you feel the hand you feel the body you feel the impulse and it does it, it, it does grow like a tree there's no reason why it just wants to and so it does and um, and and it's interesting like as art becomes like capital A art, I guess, in the way that I'm understanding it and begins to circulate through the world as a, as an edifice or as like a meme of itself or whatever, like it can lose its aura or it can lose that 
warmth of the of it being an emanation of a living person it, be, it becomes a product to be exactly it becomes a product and maybe maybe also then like at least for me and maybe maybe for for others of us here like there's an aspect of it that's like an outgrowth of a sense of intimacy with life itself it's like we want to share this intimate experience of emotion and of living or of a kind of isness or like a, a something <laughs> like something that is beyond words that's a, just a feeling of living that we that we just have this impulse to share to share to use the word that Derek you were using at the beginning that's exactly right I, I remind me what what both Claudia and Derek were talking about the idea of um uh coming together saying what needs to be said, I think is something that Claudia talked about. And then um, Derek was talking about a way of um, just sharing experience and um, creation with, with other people, whether it's a small audience like friends or just a few individuals or, or a larger audience. Um, and so then if, if art has a function, part of it is to, to connect to one another and that visceral part of it um, in some ways, perhaps at least in our current sort of artistic um, world, um, it has to be, it has to be raw. It has to be unfinished, perhaps. This, uh, this is a thesis I'm throwing out there. I don't know if it makes any sense. Obviously not. So I'll move to the next question. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, this question is, it, it gets back to modernism and postmodernism. modernism um, um, They're about form primarily. What about content? How is content made new or renewed? There's so many things that have not yet been put into art. There's so many things about our lives, our lives and our consciousness that have not made it into art yet, that don't even need to be made new yet, that just need to make it in. Yeah, or that may not even be the art object of the performance itself, like um, just people gathering in groups, whether it's a protest or whether it's, you know, an opening or just a conversation between people. Um, those don't necessarily generate art itself, but um, I think what it really shows is like a, a lot of curiosity like that. I think what when people are talking, uh, both Sheila and Ariana were talking about that that moment when something's unfinished, you get to see when that maker is potentially still curious about, about uh, doing another iteration or another version of something. Um, and sometimes maybe you ruin something or, or maybe even when you have something that's finished, it doesn't even fully contextualize or say what the artist is trying to say, even though you may have finished a book or you may have had a huge exhibition and yet still there is something beyond that. Um, so, I, I mean, I would say, uh, at least in my experience, a lot of work, even though it is finished and presented, it still feels like it's not quite finished or it still is able to live on and, and be curious and, and push curiosity and care um, to an audience or myself or to something else. But um, yeah, there's something about um, curiosity will pull more content and more context out of something. And artists are curious. Humans are, I mean, it's not artists, like humans are curious. Like we all have our own individual interests. Um, and, you know, sometimes we may think that people aren't interested in talking about those, but I don't know. I ask a lot of questions when I talk to people. So it's like, you know, I try to push that curiosity out of those people, even if it is something that like I know very little about. And that is a, a an, an art form that pushing curiosity to that that exchange, that giving and that taking is what is what um, I find the most satisfying, both in the creation of the art piece itself, or um, you know having art exhibitions out of the basement of my house in my backyard. Like those things are um, exchanges and healing and mending all at the same time, which I think is content itself. Like, I think that is context and content itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Great. Yeah, I was going to say, Claudia, do you, do you feel this impulse in the art that the artists that you work with or the um, the shows that you you present? Yeah, I, I was going to mention um, something about the art exhibitions. You know, something new is sort of created once you have a group or one solo show. But uh, after that exhibition, like Derek was mentioning, so many more questions will come up and many more, you know, like, um, I don't know, like new areas, new branches are growing through that tree. So then I will say once that art exhibition is done and these many other questions come and so many other comments, then something to be renewed in that exhibition is happening. So it's like the reinvention, like the next phase, but I will say it's one step at a time. So one place will take you to the next one. And I think it's really important just sort of like have that done to be able to go to the next step. And it's not better or not, it's just like different. It will take you in different ways. So I will say that, um, one concept is being born and then is renewed, you know, by different, in different ways, so. so in that respect, it, like you said, you mentioned that you used the word catalyzing, you know, so the, the, this, um, the artwork that's there catalyzes new artwork. And in that respect, it perhaps becomes a conversation in a way, which I think is really kind of fascinating. Um, the idea that an art institution, a museum, wh wh whatever you want, or a place where art is displayed or shared, um actually the, the curation is actually um generating a, the idea is generating a conversation i think that's really kind of fascinating not sure not why i thought of that um and and so i think um we have time for one more question and i'm trying to see if i can uh, go from where we are now to this question um but to go back to the idea of public art obviously these the statues which you don't always think of as artworks um are being torn down all over the place um, and but there is new there are new monuments that are being created. Um, obviously, I think the most famous one right now is the George, George Floyd um, mural in Minneapolis. Um, there are several murals um, here in Denver, which are just absolutely beautiful um, and heartbreaking in their own way. And so I guess the question is, is is that um, is that a conversation? Did you see that as possibly a conversation? And also and I'll probably forget where I'm going here, but the question here is more of a statement. For some of us, recent events do not represent a new reality. This is also not just a moment. It's part of a hard fought trail that we have been fighting for centuries. The idea that this is an exhilarating time feels like a very privileged position to take, especially if you're not the ones who are living in fear. And so I think in some ways, is that idea about how these monuments are changing, these public um, these public pieces of art are changing. Is it um, some way, in some way, addressing that comment? Well, I want to speak to that because I think um, I think there's a lot of people living in fear for a lot of different reasons. That that all that and those reasons are four and five hundred years old. And on you know in in the United States, like th those those reasons have to do with genocide, extraction, colonialism, and white supremacy, which which a lot with pretty much everything boils down to here. And there's a lot of different strains of and forms of very very real bodily fear, and and also consequences that that different people are living with in different ways right now i think that it's i think that it is and it isn't uh a moment it's a moment in the sense that we we all you know we're, we're looking at an election in november we're looking at a, there, there's there's a coming to the the forefront of consciousness in public space in the united states that's happening right now that hasn't happened in this way in my lifetime and yeah, it's a really, really long march, but like the, like how, how do we measure the time of it? How do we do, like, how do we respond in the best way? Um, is it, or isn't it allowed to be exhilarating? I mean, I think it's exhilarating 
for me, like it is exhilarating for me. It's all, it also, it also shakes me to the very bottom of my soul. And I think that's a mass experience, uh, that's a mass experience, but I can't, I can't know the subcutaneous experience of every person. I can only say that um, the, even like the question of what art will be um, as like, as a, as a culture um, metabolizes what it really has been, which a lot of people have always known and a lot of people have been in denial about. Like, but as this turns over and the sort of, the, the questions and the values of even what, what gets monumentalized, why do we monumentalize war and plunder? Maybe we'll monumentalize love and care. What will that even look like? What would that even mean? Will art ex ex exist in museums or in books or, or will it be murals and cho choral singing? I don't know, I'm just saying like, I think that I think that a lot is being turned over right now in the human body and in the collective. And there's, there's, there's something promising in, in the ways that what has been timeless, earlier you guys were talking about like modernism and the sort of the, the mortality of an artwork itself, but maybe there's enduring truths that have never been given their due in public space yet that that will come to take their their rightful place at the center of what it is that we're to become i don't i don't know if that made any sense at all i think so i mean so the idea that what is hopeful is that those old monuments are being torn down and the new monuments are perhaps being created um, hopeful, but also incredibly grim, right? Because these, these people are martyrs. Um, and I think that's where, that's where it's tough to feel hopeful. Um, but I think you can hold that truth of hope and um, deep grief. Um, and I think, you know, for some of us, uh, some shame as well. I mean, I think like history needs to be of course rewrite in so many different ways and then probably those monuments if not where if those were from the people that won those battles or won in that specific time and moment uh that's what you know is like reaffirmation the, and that's the 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 how we transfer the knowledge and the and what we want the other to know about the past so, but if you are about to break up all those things, then you can find a whole new world with whole new monuments all over around the city. But, um, but that's kind of deep and dive and, and, and so many questions around. But I think in this specific moment in time, it is important, like if those monuments are gonna be taken away, it, it, it is because whoever is gonna be writing or or taking over this battle is like the ones that are gonna sort of make the decision for the current moment. And then can be right and wrong for the, for the next hundred years, who knows, right? Like, I mean, it's just all like, but I think it's fair to give that capacity and possibility to the current moment, whoever takes in that specific place and time um, there leads the way or leads the path or wins a battle or something along the lines, yeah. Derek or Sheila, do you have any thoughts about this? I don't know, I, I guess I'll just reiterate that, you know, in this conversation, we're putting art in a very high place and that's okay because that's my life. It's like all that I do. And, and yet, um, like I said before, we have the ability to come to the forefront when we need and recede when we need to and, and um, redeem ourselves. Like I think uh, Claudia mentioned like reclamation, we're reclaiming some of these things. A lot of people wanna redeem themselves and that can be done personally and through through art and through making and um you know we're not always put at 
at the top. I don't think we think ourselves that way, even though art can be like a very individualistic type of thing that we make to produce. But at the same time, um, we're happy to recede to give voices to other people right now. And I think that that's, um, and use whatever strength or power or privilege that we might have to give that back. Um, and I am hopeful for that, like, as Ariane was kind of saying, bringing ideas of hope through um, change, rewriting of history. Those things are, as we're coming to an election, I mean, we have to have some hope or else we're in a lot of trouble. So <laughs> yeah, that's kind of all I have to say about that. Sheila, did you want to say anything? No, <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, it, that, that takes us past the hour. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you to our panelists. You're all very wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I really, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, everybody um, be well, take care out there. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get to all of the questions tonight, um, but have a great weekend and I hope to see you, hope to see you in person sometime very soon. If not, um, see you sometime very soon virtually. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Nice Bye, to meet you. you all. Bye. Stay well. Bye.